The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City. And as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, everybody in Washington in the Africa policy space is getting ready for the U.S.-Africa summit that is coming up on December 13th through the 15th. Now, there is a lot of excitement in the U.S. for those who follow Africa because finally the continent is getting some attention in the Beltway. Let me just read for you a little bit of a column on The Hill. The Hill is one of those DC insider publications that a lot of people on Capitol Hill read. And it's written by Kay Reva Levinson, who is a longtime Africa policy analyst and advisor in Washington. And she writes, U.S.-Africa Leader Summit and the Urgency of Now. And here's what she wrote. She said, the summit is expected to provide meat on the bones to the U.S. strategy for sub-Saharan Africa released last August, which called for reciprocity and partnership. Okay, not entirely sure what that means. I mean, it's a little bit vague and ambiguous, but I was contacted earlier this week by a reporter who asked me, he said, what do you think of what's going to happen at the summit? And I said, I don't think very much. I mean, I literally spend, what, four to five hours a day pouring through African media to look for articles and stories that we're going to cover in our newsletter. I have seen next to nothing in the press in Africa. We're talking Daily Nation, Premium Times, Mail and Guardian, pick your publication talking about this. I don't get any sense on social media of any buzz about this upcoming summit. And so I asked the reporter, I said, why should any president or prime minister be excited about this summit? What do they have to look for? Because when we look at the last summit that Obama did, he met with African leaders in groups. There was nothing really that came out of it. Kobus, I don't know if you can remember any tangible outcome that came out of it. And so I asked this reporter, I said, name me, just pick anything, name me any notable American policy on Africa. So I'm going to present the question to you, Kobus. I want you to tell me what comes to mind when I say U.S. foreign policy to Africa. Go. U.S. foreign policy to Africa. Well, U.S. strategy, any U.S. initiative, name me anything that the United States has done in terms of innovating its policy to Africa to make a president or prime minister or head of state excited about going to Washington for a summit. So when we think of U.S. Africa policy, what comes to mind? Well, I guess, firstly, you know, Biden administration's strategy towards Africa announced earlier this year, Prosper Africa, and then also Power Africa. Prosper Africa was five years ago. Power Africa was 10 years ago. And you're missing the granddaddy of them all. So the reporter I spoke with said, well, PEPFAR and Power Africa. And I went and I just said, are you kidding me? PEPFAR was literally 20 years old, <laughs> okay? It's 20 years old. That was the Bush administration. Power Africa is 10 years old. It's 2013, okay? If that's what comes to mind when we talk about U.S. foreign policy to Africa and initiatives, these guys are in big trouble because we've been talking a lot about recently on our Africa show in our newsletter about what's been going on from places like Hunan. Now, I know in Washington, people don't pay a lot of attention to what happens in the kind of south central province of Hunan. But what you are seeing is just a flurry of policy innovations that are coming out of Chinese provinces. And also, when you look at the FOCAC meeting from last year, you know, 30 to $40 billion came out of that. When you look at TCAD from this year, that's the Japanese version of that, the Tokyo International Conference on African Development, I think it is, $30 billion came out of that. The key question is what tangible outcomes 
will emerge from the U.S.-Africa summit. What do you think? You know, it's a slightly awkward moment for that because, you know, we know that the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which ensures a lot of tariff-free kind of access to the U.S. market for African products, we know that that has been a somewhat of a mixed success. You know, some African countries are using it, but not nearly as many as they could. It didn't really move the needle that much, I think, on trade. AGOA is supposed to be renegotiated in 2025. So it's both kind of like too early and too late in a way, you know, kind of because there's only a little bit of time before that. And a lot then hinges on what a go will look like, you know, kind of going forward. But I have to say that even, for example, you know, initiatives to build stronger connections between Africa and the African-American diaspora in the U.S. has largely been driven by Africa rather than by the U.S. You know, so Ghana particularly has really leaned into this kind of homecoming kind of narrative where, you know, we're having all of these very kind of big media events for African-Americans in Ghana. We saw the Biden administration kind of like name-checking diaspora links, for example, in their strategy. But, you know, it's one example of a lot of kind of areas where there's a lot of demand in Africa but seemingly not a lot of coordinated kind of meeting of that demand coming from the U.S. And let's be fair here. Africa is by no means alone in the complaint that the United States isn't innovating its policy, isn't launching new initiatives, is not sending high-level dignitaries and, and even presidential visits to the region. And it stands in sharp contrast to where I'm at here in Southeast Asia, where it seems like every third Thursday we've got another secretary you know, from the, from the Biden administration out here. So you can see what it looks like when they pay attention to a region. By the way, folks in Latin America are saying the same thing. I was talking to a leading Latin American analyst at one of the major think tanks in D.C. this week as well, and he was complaining about the same thing, that he just can't get people to pay attention. And this speaks to really what you and I, I think, believe is a crisis in U.S. foreign policy about the lack of attention to these regions in the global south that may not be primary geopolitical security challenges like Ukraine or China or Taiwan and are getting neglected by the foreign policy establishment and have been neglected for a long time. This was recently a groundbreaking story, just an amazing story by Politico senior foreign affairs correspondent Nahal Tusi, who wrote a scathing article about the neglect that's happening in Central America. And she focused specifically on Panama vis-a-vis the competition that the United States is up against with China. And that in many cases, we are simply not coming to the competition with any kind of firepower of any kind. And in many ways, seeding the ground to the Chinese in places like Latin America. We spoke with Nahal a couple weeks ago. Let's take a listen to our conversation with Politico senior foreign affairs correspondent Nahal Tusi. Nahal Tusi, welcome to the show. It's great to speak with you. Both Kobus and I have been longtime followers of your reporting. Hey, thanks so much for having me. You wrote a special report recently for Politico with a very provocative title, Frustrated and Powerless. In fight with China for global influence, diplomacy is America's biggest weakness. You said you spoke with 50 former and current U.S. foreign officials about the global competition between the U.S. and China. And you concluded that, and I'm going to quote here, America's approach to diplomacy could prove its biggest weakness. Can you explain that? Let's get started there. Well, you know, I talked to all sorts of people, and it was current and former officials, as well as analysts and and others. And what it kind of came down to was that while the Chinese are investing in and evolving and maturing in their diplomacy, and at the same time, their diplomats have tools like state-owned enterprises uh, and a focus on commercial and trade-related diplomacy that our diplomats are not as strong in, the U.S. Uh, spending on diplomacy has basically been flat. And everything from our diplomatic footprint abroad to the fact that we can't seem to confirm ambassadors because there's so much partisanship, it just seems like the U.S. system is either stagnant or on a downward slope, whereas the Chinese are trending upward in a lot of ways. Uh, now, to be clear, there's a lot of like, you know, flaws with the Chinese approach, <laughs> like the wolf warrior stuff. But, you know, if you look at the long term trend and if you think to yourself, well, the Chinese could get better at this, while the U.S. seems to be getting more partisan, more polarized, that sort of thing, it doesn't look good when it comes to diplomacy for the United States. 
So you mentioned that the United States has, over the last while, de-emphasized economic diplomacy while the Chinese have really been pushing it. What was behind the decision to step back from economic diplomacy? There's probably like a whole story just in that. And it's a number of factors. Everything from just an unwillingness to spend money, like government money, to a belief that the private sector will handle all of it, uh, and that global capitalism will just naturally help the United States in its foreign policy kind of on its own, to just traditionally, when it comes to U.S. diplomacy, the political cone of U.S. diplomats have always just had more prestige than the economic diplomats. And then there's decisions that have been made in the past like making the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service be part of the Department of Commerce as opposed to within the State Department. And there could have been some very good reasons for that. And there's occasionally you hear about like little fights over whether to keep that going. But that kind of separated that function in a way that, you know, you could argue probably wasn't great in that it meant that the State Department, although it has economic officers, which are different than commercial officers, nonetheless, again, like, put even less prestige on the idea of economic and commercial diplomacy. So it's just one of those things I think over time has just not been fantastic. And I think had it not been for the fact that China does focus so much on economic diplomacy, the U.S. probably would be fine. But the Chinese have kind of identified this as a weakness. And so they are willing to exploit it. You mentioned partisanship, and I want to kind of go into that because it really plays out all the way over here in Asia. So a lot of people are surprised that the United States does not have an ambassador to India. It does not have an ambassador to Italy in a G7 country. And there are dozens of countries around the world where it doesn't have an ambassador. And that plays out in lots of different ways. Now, a lot of Americans may go, well, who cares if we don't have an ambassador? And certainly on Capitol Hill, people don't think that is a crisis. But when the United States is trying to speak with a president, prime minister, or even a foreign minister, they oftentimes will not meet with the charge d'affaires or with anybody other than the ambassador. So when we don't have one, it causes problems. Why is it that the United States does not have ambassadors in these countries. And you mentioned partisanship is one of the reasons. Can you explain to our audience who doesn't necessarily understand the inner workings of Washington, D.C. Beltway politics as to why partisanship would be blocking ambassadors from being posted in other countries? First of all, it is worth noting that, you know, sometimes administrations, presidents, they take their time in finding and nominating people for positions. Okay. And sometimes they nominate people that really have very, very, very questionable resumes and which both sides of the aisle are not happy with. So it's worth pointing those things out. But then what happens from what I can tell is that this is still one of those areas where when it comes to foreign policy, the senators feel like they can make a partisan point and get points for it without getting really any significant backlash because they don't see there being much real fallout, right? So they don't really seem to do that as much when it comes to funding for the Pentagon, right? Because man, then that could be spun in a way that makes them look really bad. But if they want to make a point about ambassadors in Latin America, because they want to appeal to a Cuban American constituency in Florida, or a Haitian American one, or a Nicaraguan American one, this is still one of those levers that they can pull as an individual senator and just slow down the process and make it hard for there to be an ambassador. And I think partly it's because they don't understand how often an ambassador can make a real difference, especially in some countries where, I mean, there are some countries out there that like, it seems like the entire government like runs on WhatsApp, you know, and it is wild, like how just having the right contact and the right title will get you access in a way that others just can't. And so having an ambassador who's well connected, who has that kind of backing, it can just cut through so much red tape in some of these countries. And look, I think A lot of countries are like, fine, you know, you go for a few months without an ambassador. They're kind of used to it. But some of these countries have not had U.S. ambassadors there for years. The case that I focused on most was Panama, which went for four and a half years without a U.S. ambassador. And in the beginning, they're fine. But after a while, they just feel insulted. 
And over time, it just builds and there's just kind of a resentment in a sense that the United States doesn't care. And again, if the U.S. was like didn't face any sort of rivalry, it could probably get away with this for a very long time. But the Chinese have ambassadors everywhere. And some of their ambassadors are very, very good. And if the American ambassador, if there's no one to talk to, or wh if whoever is in charge, the charge has no actual power, then why not talk to the Chinese guy who's happily, happily waiting there in your lounge, eager to talk to you? So if I understand your report correctly, U.S. diplomatic budgets exceed those from China. And also the number of personnel involved also seems, although, the, the, you know, like it's difficult to ascertain exactly how many Chinese diplomats there are, it seems like the State Department and related services have more people on the job as well. So what do you ascribe the relative success of the Chinese diplomats and the, rel well, you know, failure is a strong word, but like, you know, the, this kind of like in, in this horse race, like why do the Chinese seem to be pulling ahead when, when they seem to be working with smaller budgets and fewer people? Yeah, no, this is a really good question. Part of it is about trends and part of it is about focus, right? So this, the diplomatic budget and the staffing of the State Department has basically been stagnant for about a decade, whereas the Chinese have been spending more for sure, like at least 50% more, if I remember correctly, over the past decade on diplomacy. And that's basically what we know. I mean, it, it's probably, it could be even more. And it appears that they have more diplomats, but it's, it, again, it's pretty vague, so it's a little, it's a little hard to tell. But also, the Chinese, they go and focus on places where the U.S., doesn't pay as much attention, right? So we might have an absolutely massive embassy in London, right? That does a lot of stuff and is very, very important. And the Chinese are there too, and they probably have a pretty big one there too. But the Chinese also are, on, are in like the Pacific Islands where we haven't had ambassadors. They have people in places across Africa and, and Latin America where the U.S. isn't as present or just even if it's there, their people are not particularly out and about. The Chinese diplomats, for instance, they can just go outside without much security. The U.S. diplomats have much more rigorous standards. And it's worth noting that actually there have been polls and, and or surveys that have shown that the Chinese now have more diplomatic facilities overseas than the United States does. That includes embassies and consulates. So it's like they just have more points of presence. Even if it's just one guy, they're there and they're in places where the U.S. is not. And that can actually make a pretty big difference. And it's not just in the diplomatic realm that this is happening, but CSIS, the think tank in Washington, did a survey a couple of years ago measuring the military attaches assigned to embassies and noted that the Chinese are assigning higher ranking military attaches at colonel levels and above. And oftentimes in places like Africa, the rank of military attaches is falling and they are pulling back the number of military attaches. So I think this is playing out beyond just ambassadors and diplomats, but in other people assigned to embassies as well. And again, to your point, it's a sign of respect in many countries, or at least the perception that it is. You had a lot of countries that you could have picked, and you even wrote in your article that you could have gone to Kenya or the Solomon Islands, but you chose to focus on Panama. Why Panama? Oh, that's a really good question. So like I actually originally wanted to go to the Solomon Islands because I saw this kind of growing rivalry between the US and China over the Solomon Islands. But then like so I had this idea and I, I laid out like this whole pitch to my editor. And then the next day, a major news organization basically wrote that story. <laughs> So you got scooped. So, <laughs> so I was like, no, you know, and my editors were like, oh, you can still do it. You can, you know, and the original idea was going to be like the fight between the U.S. and China over the Solomon Islands. That was how I was thinking about it. Right. And but I am also one of those people who just hates doing anything that like other people are doing or that like if I see a lot of people have already written about it or are focusing on it, I just don't want to go there. I prefer to kind of tread a different road. And so once I saw that that major news organization wrote that story, I realized, first of all, that it was pretty clear the White House was going to make a thing of this in the coming months. And so you're going to see just a lot more news coverage of that Solomon Island angle. <laughs> So I was like, I'm not doing that. And to be really frank, like China in Africa is a very important piece of it, but it also has gotten a ton of attention over the years. So I just wasn't sure if I could really find, you know, something new to say there. Uh, so I just did a bunch of research and went back through like, you know, other past reporting on various little pieces and talked to some experts and former ambassadors and the like. And 
I just kept coming back to Panama because it just seemed to have all of these features that seem to capture elements of this rivalry. Plus, I realized that, oh my gosh, this isn't just about a fight over some islands. This is about American diplomacy and its future. And the fact that the United States government, you know, on a bipartisan basis, keeps saying China is the great strategic challenge that we face in the long run. And they keep spending tons of more money on everything from tech to the Pentagon to all these other things. And diplomacy is supposedly one of those pieces that they care about, but they're just not really doing anything about it. So, you know, it just all kind of came together. And I realized, as you saw within the story, that, that I did talk about other global examples. So in a way, it was a very global story. But Panama just ended up being, and, and you know, there was also the appeal of the canal and the history. And, and then when I realized that, you know, we hadn't had an ambassador there in four and a half years, I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> I have to go. So... When your article came out, I mentioned it on an earlier show, and after we confirmed that we were going to speak with you, I told everybody how much I was looking forward to speaking with you. And We have a listener in Panama who wrote us a note, and he was critical of your article, and I'd like to get your response, if that's okay. And if I'd like to read a short note that he wrote, and just to get your take on it. He said, I just paid for my coffee here in Panama using U.S. dollars. The only money used in Panama is U.S. dollars. There are dozens of flights every day between Panama and U.S. cities. The Panama Canal has constant growth because of the U.S. economy. Panama has over 90 banks, and that is largely because of U.S. ties. Panamanians desire more to go to the U.S. than anywhere else. The U.S. Embassy is overextended with all the applications. Almost everything is oriented to the U.S., even though, sure, an ambassador may be absent. Yes, Chinese companies fund some visible projects in Panama, but it is nowhere close to the continued impact and importance of the U.S. The article you mentioned in your podcast from Nahal Tusi misses the mark in my view. The author points out projects in Panama as an anecdote of Chinese impact, but it is truly trivial compared to the U.S. economic impact in Panama, which was overlooked. What's your thought to that critique? Well, I didn't overlook that. There were actually like multiple paragraphs devoted to laying out some of the very same things that this person pointed out, including the use of the U.S. dollar, the you know shared values, the long history, the fact that the U.S. remains Panama's number one source of foreign direct investment. That's all in there. Uh, but again, the point that I was trying to make was that this is about trends in the future, right? This is about trajectories. And this is a partner country. It's a friendly country that the U.S. is not treating as well as it could be treated, right? If things were so, so great, and if just absolutely wonderful, Panama probably wouldn't have switched its recognition from Taiwan to Beijing a few years ago. So again, like, I think the writer is correct in saying that overall, Panamanian orientation is definitely toward the US. But that's also something that I very much I mean, you can just look in the in the article, you'll see I, I capture all of that I stated. But again, it's about the future and trends and whether the United States is missing an opportunity. And like it kind of did with the Solomon Islands, you know, 30 years ago when it decided to close its embassy there. And then 30 years later, it's suddenly like, oh, we need to open an embassy because the Chinese have really built their influence here. You know, and and I would just reflecting on the article, I would also say that in a lot of ways, the fact that it is this kind of quote unquote America's backyard, you know, or like, you know, that it is such a like key part of that kind of Monroe doctrine sphere of influence kind of power landscape makes the growth of Chinese influence there even more notable, I think. But in, in a broader kind of field, looking at it, at it globally, one of the things that we hear very, very often in conversations with stakeholders from global South governments is this continuing refrain that they don't want to be pushed to choose sides. You know, kind of the push to choose sides thing has become such a strong narrative that one now frequently sees both U.S. and Chinese diplomats also kind of name-checking the need to not push people to choose sides, even as they are both pushing people to choose sides. So I was wondering how that narrative is playing into U.S. diplomacy at the moment, and the need to avoid the optics of pushing sides is is or, or push, the, the, avoiding the optics of of making people choose sides is factoring into how diplomacy is actually you know run on the ground. Absolutely. I mean, I think that is definitely a key concern for U.S. diplomats, as well as Chinese diplomats. I mean, Chinese diplomats say that. They, they insist, look, we're not here to, like, rival the U.S. We can't really even take them on. We want to grow, like, 
uh, this is what the ambassador was telling me. He's like, we want to grow the economic pie for everyone. And even the U.S. could benefit from us being here. But U.S. officials just don't take China's word on that at, at face value. They see strategic and security concerns with any sort of growing Chinese presence in this region, uh, which ironically, they often ignore. And that is one of the things that drives people in Latin America absolutely crazy. I mean, first of all, they say, look, we don't want any of this Monroe Doctrine stuff. That was like something the Trump administration was willing to talk about. The Biden administration doesn't talk that way. I mean, they talk about partnerships. They're not talking about like, you're within our sphere of influence and we want to control you. It's not like that. And it's not what Latin American leaders want. But what they want are like, renewed or new trade deals. They want infrastructure projects. They want partnerships. And yet they feel like the United States just isn't competing or even isn't even trying, uh, whether it's for like a metro project in, in Colombia or, or a port in Colombia or other types of projects and other things where they just really feel like the United States isn't competing. And they feel like they're taken for granted. And, you know, you could argue that they have a point. I mean, how often do you see U.S. officials even talking about Latin America or making it an issue? I'm working on a, well, I don't want to, I don't want to give too much away, but let's just say that like, you know, I'm working on uh, this short piece about measuring one particular way that President Biden engages with other countries. And it's pretty clear that like Latin America, not a priority. And Africa is even less of a priority, according to this one way of measuring it. So it's very strange. But no, but you're right. The U.S. officials, they don't come there and say, you have to choose. I think they realize that that would be pretty offensive to a lot of these countries because these countries are sovereign. And when I asked Panamanian leaders, or former officials, like why they decided to switch diplomatic relations from Taiwan to Beijing and why they didn't tell the U.S. in advance... <laughs> One of the things they told me was, well, first of all, we're a sovereign country and we can do whatever we want and we don't have to tell the U.S. anything. And so they were kind of offended at the idea uh, that they should have even engaged the U.S. on it. And the fact that you have seen several countries in Latin America switch their recognitions from Taiwan to Beijing is a really important sign of China's growing influence in this hemisphere. You know, one of the things that you hear in Washington quite a bit, I'm sure you've probably heard it before, is that the United States can't go toe to toe with the Chinese on spending, that the Belt and Road is something that our system just isn't set up to compete with. And our good friend Jude Moore over at the Center for Global Development uh, in D.C., a think tank there, he made this very interesting point that I'd like to get your take on. It's not that the United States can't afford to do its own Belt and Road, or as it's called now, B3W or PGII, or any of these acronyms that they're throwing out these days. It's that, that it chooses not to, that during the total global war on terror, according to Brown University, the United States spent $8 trillion. So if we wanted to, we could have done maybe 16 or 17 Belt and Roads during that time, but we chose to spend it on the global war on terror. The U.S. Defense Department budget, according to USA Spending, is $1.94 trillion. But yet our diplomacy budget is only $84 billion, which sounds like a lot of money. But as you said, it's spread across six big, giant departments, and the breadth of what they have to do is quite large. So the priorities just aren't on diplomacy. The priorities are on military. And what you're talking about is a robust diplomatic engagement, or this is the consequences of what happens when you don't have a robust diplomatic engagement. And I guess the weird part for me is that when I'm in D.C. talking to on Capitol Hill or even at the State Department or in the White House, everybody's talking about China, 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 to quote our former president. How do you reconcile all of that? That China's the priority, they don't want to spend on diplomacy, but yet we spend a lot on military. Yeah, I mean, some of it comes down to ideology, I think. For a long time, U.S. officials, especially on the Republican side, but not just on the Republican side, they don't like the idea of government being in the business of building <laughs> things overseas when they see that that is the private sector's role. And Except if the Pentagon is doing it, by the way, because they were very <laughs> robust on doing that in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere, right? You know, honestly, it's interesting. You're, you're making the war on terror comparison. Like, if the U.S. had actually spent... A bunch of that money on investing and building in a lot of these countries, if it had been able to security wise, we might not ha have seen as many terrorists <laughs> emerge from a lot of these places. <laughs> There's a lot of, you know, academic 
research and scholarship on that. And some of it might actually, you know, contradict what I just said. But it often is about priorities. It often is about the strength of a particular sector, right? So look, you have defense manufacturers who have a tremendous amount of sway on Capitol Hill, right? You have lobbyists. I mean, the Defense Department undergird so much of the U.S. economy on so many levels. You don't have the same for diplomacy. I mean, who is going to go and like be like, you have to keep this diplomatic program open at this college? I mean, it's In the just, Solomon it, Islands. There's just no... <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's just no... I mean, there's... Look, <laughs> look, look, let's be frank. A lot of people make a lot of money off of conflict, And diplomacy is designed to avoid conflict or to bring it to an end. And so there's not as much financial incentive, whereas you also have partisan incentives to make some sort of a show of your political credentials. And so that's why you have people like Senator Ted Cruz being upset over a decision involving Nord Stream and deciding he's going to put a hold on pretty much every single State Department nominee that was up before the Senate. For weeks or months, it was. It was really extraordinary. I mean, it's just an easy target, and it doesn't have a lot of powerful defenders, and it doesn't have the same sort of power that the Pentagon does, even though some of the biggest people who like will tell you they really want more spending on diplomacy are Pentagon leaders. And they have told that to Congress, and Congress just doesn't care. You pointed out in your article that the Biden administration has tended to focus on economic frameworks in, in the engagement we've seen over the last year, like both the engagement with Southeast Asia and with South America and Central America in the Summit of the Americas, tended to focus on these kind of economic frameworks with a strong kind of focus on supply chains and norm setting, you know, making sure there's kind of environmental norms across the board and so on. And you also pointed out that these tend to not get a very enthusiastic response. And one of the reasons that other people pointed out that we spoke to in the past was that it's economically not really feasible for the US government to offer additional market access to the US to these countries. And that's really what both South American and Southeast Asian countries really want is greater access to the US market. But that's just not going to work at the moment. So I was hoping you could kind of reflect a little bit on this dynamic and, you know, kind of you know, the, the role these kind of domestic political factors are playing in kind of international economic diplomacy and what, what you see as a future of these of, of these frameworks, like, for example, the, the, uh, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework that, that was announced for Southeast Asia. It's election day, right? So a lot, I mean, let's, let's not forget that. So a lot of what happens with these frameworks and things in the future could come down to who is running our political institutions following this election and, and 2024. So yeah, but look, at, in terms of the issue of an economic framework versus economic market access, politically, yeah, it's just become poisonous in the United States to go out there and say, we need to give more access to our market to other countries. This type of trade deal is just not something right now that a lot of Americans want to hear about. And it's partly because many of these Americans feel like past globalization, past trade deals, they have left them in the lurch because they have starve their areas of manufacturing and jobs and other things. And so they, many of these Americans have suffered, even if in the aggregate, the U.S. economy and the U.S. population has benefited by everything from, you know, keeping prices low to having ample labor. But no, right now, whether you're a Democrat or Republican and you're running for president or anything, I mean, just talking about a trade deal is just not going to win you votes. It's going to get a lot of people upset. So no, so instead, the Biden administration turns to these economic frameworks. And it's not that these are necessarily bad ideas. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of things that a lot of these other countries are fine with. I mean, yes, they want to be more independent supply chain wise, the idea of like, having environmental standards, things like that. I mean, some of them do feel a little bit frustrated. They don't have the capacity to like implement some of these things. But I think the thing that kind of drives them crazy more than anything is like, they just feel like it's a lot of it's theoretical, and they're not really going to get any actual benefit to their own populations out of it that they would out of a trade deal or something that's just more concrete. Then there's another piece of this too, which is because of the partisanship, and the way that US foreign policy, unlike in the past, seems to increasingly be like an a pendulum. They just don't know if these plans are going to last, right? So every time a new president comes in, they're like, oh, we're going to review 
the previous administration's policies, right? So everything kind of freezes. They take forever, like months and months and months to review the policy. And then they come up with their own. So everything goes back to like zero. And these countries are like, we just got used to this other program. And now you're telling us to adopt a new one. And we don't know if Congress is going to fund it because we don't know who's going to be in charge and whether you're going to get along with them, Mr. President. And so you're just, you know, you're just making promises that we're not even sure you can keep. So it just erodes that kind of faith that people have in the long-term stability of U.S. foreign policy, which is another point that I was trying to make in the story. It just says, it's not just a matter of not being able to confirm ambassadors. That's a very obvious example. But it's the fact that like people just don't think they can have a consistent long-term reliance on U.S. foreign policy because of the partisan swings. Whereas with the Chinese, they feel like, okay, these are guys who like have plans that last for 10 or 20 or 30 years. We think they'll probably be there and we can count on that. I do want to throw in one other example on the partisanship front, which is that, you know, the State Department authorization bill, which is like a bill that for the Defense Department, the Defense Department version has to pass every single year. That is, it's it's considered like the must pass bill. And the State Department authorization bill last year was the first time in nearly 20 years that that bill actually passed. The Congress got its act together put together a State Department authorization bill that set spending targets and priorities and things like that, made its voice clear about what it wants to see the State Department be like. But guess how it passed? It passed because they added it to the Defense Department authorization bill. That's how it got through. I mean, that just says it all right there. I mean, I I don't know. It's not even subtle. Yeah. And so like when this happened, I just I couldn't even believe it. Like I was I thought it was the most amazing. Like and I just remember thinking like, oh, my God, I have to find a way to use this like in a bigger story. And it wasn't like people didn't know it, but like I just saved it to like include it in like this story that kind of laid out the broader issue of priorities and how partisanship and other things really affect them. Well, you wrote that many countries find that China is a willing partner when the United States is not. And you said China appears intent on winning hearts and minds while the United States comes across as arrogant. And the fact that those phrases came from the senior foreign affairs correspondent at Politico. I mean, it didn't come from Mother Jones. It didn't come from The Nation. It didn't come from The Guardian in London. It came from Politico. For those of our listeners who aren't familiar with Politico, it's intensely read inside Washington. So those words were consumed in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the Senate Intelligence Committee, the House Foreign Relations Committee, the National Security Council. I mean, all throughout Washington, people read your article. I was fascinated to think about what kind of reaction did you get? What did people say when they read your article? Because it's pretty damning. First of all, I just want to say it wasn't my opinion. I was channeling what other people were telling me. (laughs) So, okay. Fair um, enough, but as the reporter, but yeah, um, as the reporter, no, the reactions I got were almost uniformly like, "Yeah, you nailed it." I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's not what no no one reacted no. with indignity and like, "What?" No, I mean, how dare it. you? No, but see, that's almost worse in some respects, don't you think? Like, yeah, we know we're sucking, but okay. I mean, I think it's just a systematic challenge. Like, there are people within the U.S. diplomatic system who are really, really frustrated by how things are. They want things to be more efficient, more ambitious, but they do feel a sense of, like, they they do understand when people say that the U.S. comes across as arrogant. Now, remember, during the Trump years, that felt like it was, like, supersized, right? I mean, it was just kind of hard. I, the idea of, like, Mike Pompeo being like, we have swagger and things like that. And that sign, I think that came across probably a bit, more harshly than he intended. I'm sure he, what he probably meant was just that the U.S. should have confidence. But what kind of drove me crazy and like where I felt like I found personal evidence of this was that when I would go and talk to U.S. diplomats, like, you know, who, you know, the State Department sanctioned to talk to me and that sort of thing, I would ask about the Chinese and what they were doing. And their response was <laughs> almost always to bash the Chinese as opposed to point to U.S. strengths. Like, they would be like, well, but the Chinese have these problems and the Chinese projects don't always work. And the Chinese, they, they don't have as many people and they're, they have wolf warriors. And we have this long history. We have all these ties. We have the money that we've been spending for a long time. We have, they were like relying on like 
their old long-standing glory in the face of an upstart rising challenge. And I was like, are you serious? Like, I honestly, I think that was my reaction to like one group of them. I was like, that's your defense is that, oh, the other side sucks. Like, really? Like, well, isn't that like a reflection of our politics of owning the libtards, right? You know, that's how we do it. The Republicans score points off the Democrats, the Democrat. That's how we do politics today. It's not about coming up with new ideas. It's about scoring points on the other side. I mean, it was really strange. Like, I, you know, I, I got this somewhat on the Hill as well. Like, you know, the, the, the folks would just be like, yeah, but it's all, you know, here's the problems with the Chinese. And we don't think you should like, you know, think too highly of where the Chinese are going. And I'm just like, you guys, like the Chinese today are much more sophisticated than they were 20 years ago when it comes to diplomacy. And there's no reason to think that they're not going to figure things out, right? So the Chinese ambassador in Panama, whom I spoke to, one of the things that really got me was like, first of all, he was totally fine to talk to me. He totally hung out with me for like an hour and a half. Of course, he had like someone with him. They always do. They monitor each other. He had his talking points and, you know, largely stuck to them. But one of the things that really was revealing to me was that he told me he didn't really speak much English. OK. And I was like, you know what? We'll figure it out. And I don't really speak enough Spanish. But when we got there and we sat down, his English was great. It was great. OK. And then when he wouldn't remember an English word, he would sub in a Spanish word. That's how good his Spanish was, okay? And if you get more diplomats like this guy, who everybody in Panama was like, yeah, that guy's really good, the U.S. is going to have a real challenge on its hand. The article is frustrated and powerless in fight with China for global influence. Diplomacy is America's biggest weakness, written by Politico senior foreign affairs correspondent Nahal Tusi. Nahal, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. It's a fascinating article, and we love your coverage of foreign affairs from Washington, almost like a foreign correspondent. You're one of the rare reporters in Washington who covers it like a foreign beat, so I do recommend people follow you. If they want to follow you on Twitter just to see what you're reading and writing these days, where can they find you? I am at Nahal Tusi. That's N-A-H-A-L-T-O-O-S-I. And thank you so much for having me. This was really a pleasure. Wonderful. We'll put a link to the article and to Nahal's Twitter link right in the show notes. Thank you so much, Nahal. Kobus, I get hate from our haters. You don't get the hate. I get the hate for being too negative on the United States. And I was accused on some of the comments on Apple Podcasts of being, I think it was, you know, left-wing critic of the U.S. or something like that. I feel a little bit vindicated right now, I have to be honest with you, because what she was saying in her reporting is basically the same thing that I've been saying, because we're talking to the same people. And they're saying the same thing, how many people inside the U.S. government are frustrated. They want to do more. But the politics are oppressive in the United States. And I think there is this sense that says, well, we're the United States. And this is the Tucker Carlson kind of line. We're America. Everybody likes us, no matter what we do. And it's this mediocrity that is pervading so much of what we do as a country and as a diplomacy and as a politics. And I don't think, and I fundamentally don't think, this is what I said in our show when I came back from Washington this summer, that people in D.C. truly understand the challenge that they're up against with the Chinese. Now, let me be very clear here, just so that there's no misunderstanding by, by haters or anybody else. I actually don't think Chinese diplomacy is that competent. The bar is actually pretty low here. You and I have spoken repeatedly of how the Chinese are terrible at public diplomacy and communications. They are oftentimes bullies. You know, they say, we don't want you to choose, which is a lie. Because at the end of the day, if a sovereign government decides that it wants to recognize Taiwan or it wants to take a vote on Xinjiang that's different or it wants to do things that are really contrary to what China defines as its core interests – guess what? You're going to have to choose pretty quickly because the Chinese are going to come down on you pretty hard. We know that. We've seen that pattern repeated many, many times. Okay? So I don't want to necessarily inflate the Chinese as some super diplomats who are just getting everything right. This is what we call in the China watching communities the 10-foot tall monster, that oftentimes we will elevate China to be this really overwhelming presence when in fact, eh, you know, they're as bumbling as any other government. But the United States is just falling down at the start line here. And I think that's what this article channeled in many ways. Yes, I think so. I think what it also kind of evoked for me quite strongly is that I think China and the United States, just in, in their, their global, their, their kind of, their, their, their kind of mental landscape 
that defines their view of the world is a little bit different. And we, we see it very frequently when one hears these, you know, as, as, we, as we've discussed frequently, the different poll results about the popularity of the United States and China in, in different parts of the world. And you would frequently hear American representatives you know, saying like, yes, China's popularity is cratering right throughout the world. You see it, you know, kind of if you look at Poland, if you look at Slovenia, if you look at, at Scandinavia, you know, China's just like New Zealand, China's unpopular everywhere. And then you're like, yeah, if you look at the rest of the world, if you actually include the global south, then everything looks very, very different. And, you know, so I think the US is just, you know, they have a set of core allies that they're very used to working with. And I think they tend to kind of get their, their worldview reflected back to them from these core allies. And I think it's harder for them to deal with a situation not only where China, you know, kind of is is seen on a, on a quite equal footing to the United States as parts of Africa. And, and we actually covered, you know, new polling in, in South East Asia also showing that that popular perceptions of China is actually the China is actually more popular among ordinary people in Southeast Asia than even among Southeast Asian elites. So that kind of situation, I think, offers a, a big challenge to the United States. And with it, then there is there seems to be a kind of a an assumption that anyone who is anti-Western, quote unquote, like anyone who has kind of continuing Zen resentments against Europe or the United States, that they're just, you know, ideologically corrupt or crazy or, you know, kind of choose your insult. Rather than really reckoning with the fact that the United States has some popularity issues in parts of the global south for very specific historical reasons and reasons that the Chinese frequently don't deal with, right? Kind of because the Chinese are frequently kind of a blank slate compared to the US. Actually kind of like dealing with the actual issues that some people in the global south you know even if those if those can also be misinformed or biased or wrong like actually dealing with those things rather than simply condemning them or, or dismissing them as chinese propaganda or misinformation or whatever th there already lies a core challenge i think to be like yeah we realize you have issues with the war on terror or other you know kind of like the, the invasion of libya you know different regions have different issues but you know like yeah we, we realize we acknowledge that you have these issues and we're working to move forward together that is a big challenge that i feel there isn't really a space in the in the u.s to like political discourse to make space for that challenge but it's a very big challenge anyway and the chinese are really leaning into it in in, in africa particularly and i, I sometimes feel that american stakeholders don't 100 percent appreciate how big a challenge that is well a reason why American stakeholders don't understand a lot of what's going on. And that survey that you referenced about how the publics in here in Southeast Asia tend to favor China more than the elites reflects the fact that a lot of the things that people see the Chinese doing are not covered in the U.S. press. So let me just give you a list of things. And again, it goes back to the fact that the Chinese are making stuff happen. Facts on the ground. And again, you can... Talk about the debt, we can talk about the undue influence, we can talk about lots of different things. But at the end of the day, the largest deep sea port now exists in Lagos, in Nigeria, at the Lekki port. There is a high-speed railway now between Jakarta and Bandung. There is a railway that crosses from Laos into China. There's $65 billion worth of infrastructure being built right now in Pakistan. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. Things are happening on the ground to bring badly needed infrastructure to the global south. You can't say here in Vietnam or in other countries that you're seeing the impact of American engagement because American engagement tends to be, for the most part, either through trade, which we don't see, the average person doesn't see, or oftentimes it's focusing on civil and political issues, or it's on tech and finance. These are not physical things that we can see, very important as they are. We're still a very important trading country, a very important power, but the everyday guy doesn't see the fact that, well, an American didn't build my mobile network. I'm not using an American phone. Apple phones are too expensive for most people in the global south. But I am using a Huawei phone or a Transon phone and a ZTE network. People know that Boomplay in Africa, the music service, is Chinese. They know that Start Times is Chinese. So they're touching and seeing the impact of Chinese engagement, but they're not seeing that from the United States. I don't believe that Americans, for the most part, get that. 
Yes, there's lots of kind of nuance that that one needs to kind of like add in there, including, you know, obviously like... There's a lot of caveats, a lot of caveats, I admit that. Including like US companies do have a very large presence, you know, kind of across the global south. So I agree with you in that the intangibility of some aspects of of, of US engagement makes it more of a challenge to promote it. What I think, though, that this, you know, which is an additional challenge... Is that you know in, in some okay in some ways it's, it's like in the past I've, I've I've pointed out some kind of like similarities between the U.S. and China you know which I think will probably make no one happy on on any side but you know one one of the really big differences between the two is that China is particularly now like particularly in the kind of like post you know second like post twentieth party Congress China is this massive monolith of mystery right kind of like no one knows what's going on in China like you know that like China has become even more mysterious than it was already considerably mysterious before and it's even more mysterious now. Contrasting to that, the US is very transparent, right? Kind of like any, anyone who has any kind of interest in, in what's going on in the US and who, who can, who particularly who can read English, within seconds, you know, kind of like tap into national debates in, in the US. You know, so in that sense, then that casts kind of everything in a, in a different light because the rest of the world knows what the US thinks of it. Right, and the rest of the world knows what's going on in the U.S. and can then contrast it in in relation to the messages put out by American diplomats. So the key example of that is the the very strong promotion of democracy and the framing of democracy as being under siege by autocracy. In you know, kind of by like that, the Biden administration is really promoted. While we like everyone is also watching the January six hearings, watching everyone talk about possibly Donald Trump coming back. Everyone watch, watching what's happening with. Twitter. Like all of these things are happening in plain sight in the US, but at the same time, there's this very strong messaging that the US is this paragon of democracy and is aggressively promoting democracy around the world. So, you know, those two things are kind of both true at the same time, but they sit under, they sit next to each other in a, in a very kind of awkward way. And all of the messaging coming from US diplomats, then each time someone pushes a very strong pro democracy message, there is this, this kind of asterisk next to it being like, yet also within the US there's some other issues you know kind of going on so that's a really kind of complicated kind of like position to message from and there's also just a massive reservoir of goodwill towards the united states whether it's earned or justified is a totally different story but in many parts of africa and we see this here in southeast asia as well people are very familiar with american pop culture they're very familiar with, you know, American universities and American television and, and Netflix shows and all of that, that I think, you know, really enhances, you know, brand USA. This is a part of the discussion that I think falls down in many respects. The Chinese sometimes, I think, are blinded to the fact that a lot of people in Africa and in other developing countries really admire China's economic trajectory from the 1970s to the present. Wow. You went from a country poorer than most developing countries to the second largest economy in the world. You have a maglev train in Shanghai. You have amazing office towers. We want that. But we're not that keen on the autocracy. We're not that keen on the lack of transparency. We don't like the lack of freedom of the press. And people in Nigeria and Kenya and other parts of the world, even here in Southeast Asia, look at this as a buffet where it's not a one size fits all. And oftentimes, I think in the U.S. discourse, it's often binary. You either like us or you like them. And as you said, both can be true at the same time. They like parts of the U.S. system and they like parts of the Chinese system. And that's my understanding of where a lot of people are on choosing is they want both. Yeah, they want both. And, and they want it on their own terms. And also the wanting both comes with the understanding, I think, within the global south that even though they want both, they can actually have neither, right? Um, because the Chinese system is so unique to China. There's no easy replication of the Chinese system, right? Even if one wants to, it's like very difficult to replicate that. And, you know, it's also not the easiest thing in the world to really just simply say, okay, we're going to like just apply an American system, among others, because so much of this has to do with not only with the power of the American state, which is unique in the world, but also with the buy-in of American companies. You know, and as Nahal you know, pointed out, very many American companies don't want to do business in the global south. They have their own reasons and they frequently just don't bid for big projects. Because they feel the risks and the margins just are not worth it. Exactly. So in that situation, like it even more pushes these countries into like, yeah, we want this from the US, we want this from China, but we, what we end up getting is, what, is the little bits that we can get from them. 
you know and that then like is is a very different equation you know and and that 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 is the the reality of the choosing sides this is you know kind of people don't get to choose sides what they what they get to do is to try and kind of get crumbs from this side and crumbs from that side and try to kind of make it work you know which is a very very different thing and and that's also frequently not acknowledged actually by diplomats on either side and i don't want to leave the impression that the united states and china are the only choices by no means is that the case. Japan is a model. Turkey is a model. Europe is certainly a model. Even here in Southeast Asia, other countries emulate Vietnam in their economic models. So there's a lot going on in this space. We focused on the U.S. and China today. But again, I don't want people to think that that's how we see the world, that it's binary between the U.S. and China and developing country X, Y, and Z only can choose from those countries. I do want to point out that Nahal's article, to me, stood out. It was rather unique. You don't see this type of critical coverage. There's a lot of negative coverage in the U.S. press, but it rarely goes to the foundation of who we are as a government and as a people and our principles, the way that she did. That was very interesting. I thought some people would take some umbrage with it. Like, how dare you question us, right? We're better than the Chinese. Of course, we're better than the Chinese. You know, I I don't know if she talked to the MAGA folks because I don't know how they would align on this, but I think we need to become more familiar with MAGA thinking because MAGA is coming back. We're recording this show prior to the midterm elections. By the time you listen to the show, the elections will be done. And maybe even by the time that this show is out, Donald Trump will have declared his candidacy for the presidency again. Everybody expects this to happen. So we're going into a whole new world. New rules are going to apply because the second Trump administration is not going to look anything like the first Trump administration should he win. At this point, we don't know who the Democrats are going to put up against Trump. I mean, there's no way Joe Biden can run again, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, how old can we go, right? I mean, we're starting to make the Soviet Politburo look incredibly young, which is just... So alarming. So alarming. The thing is, if there's one thing that Nahal's article, you know, kind of made clear, is that whatever happens within the US is going to reverberate across the world. The kind of fight that the US has ends up being won or lost within its borders. But isn't that Jay Shankar's, the external affairs minister of India's point, that the US and Europe will internationalize their domestic problems? Yeah, but also this is the full force of the reality that the U.S. is a norm setter. It generates concepts and it generates vocabularies that then end up like blowing across the world like, you know, that seeds and, and kind of, you know, t- t- you know, kind of sprouting root everywhere. And it, it's true in a, in a good way, you know, kind of like that is the U.S. did have that effect on democracy in lots of ways, and particularly kind of like in the language of various specific kind of liberation struggles, LGBT liberation being a particular example. But it's also true in, in relation to kind of right wingism and, and MAGA stuff and so on, you know, like they did find very fertile ground, like, you know, kind of throughout the Trump era. So whatever direction the US goes domestically ends up being the way that it goes internationally. So, you know, we'll have to see. Let's leave the conversation there. If this is the kind of thing that you love to think about, we can give you a lot to think about every single day. Go to ChinaGlobalSouth.com. You'll see all of the coverage of what we're doing with our teams in the Middle East, in Asia, and in Africa. We're embarking on a huge endeavor now to start doing a lot more climate coverage. And uh, we also have China researchers who are mining WeChat and Weibo and all the Chinese social networks for the latest research, for latest news, and things that you will never see in other sources. So the whole point of what we're doing is trying to save you time. So rather than you going all throughout the internet, trying to figure out what source is legit, what one is not, what's a rumor, what's not, Our team is doing that for you, and you get this digest delivered to your inbox every morning at 6 a.m. Washington time, which basically in five minutes, you can see what the Chinese have done and what the issues are and what the main topics are, what the latest policy briefs are. And so this is what we're offering to folks. We really, really hope that you'll give it a try. Try it for 30 days for free. See if you like it. Go to ChinaGlobalSouth.com slash subscribe, and you'll get a 30-day free trial. We also have free newsletters 
in French and Arabic. Those links are in the show notes as well. So Kobus and I will be back again next week with another edition of the China Global South podcast. Until then, I'm Eric Olander for Kobus van Staden. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South Project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at ChinaGlobalSouth.com where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's ChinaGlobalSouth.com.